Prepare yourself now as God's teacher for this hour, Dr. Howard C. Estep, brings the prophetic message, The Millennium. In this video sermon, we are discussing and explaining the Millennial Kingdom. It's an interesting message. I believe you'll learn things about the Bible today that you never knew before. You know, there's coming a time upon the earth when there will be health and wealth and prosperity for everybody upon the earth. It won't be a day of social checks or the government handout. It will be a time of God's blessing poured out upon the inhabitants of the earth during the millennial kingdom. The time that we are referring to is here in this 1,000 year reign. The millennium, that means a thousand years. The millennial kingdom is the time when there's going to be absolute universal prosperity upon the earth. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verses 44 through 45. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. In that dream, he saw a great image. It had a head of gold. It had two arms of silver. It had a stomach or a belly of brass. It had uh, two legs of iron, and then it had ten toes or two feet, part iron and part clay. Now, as I read these two verses, imagine you're looking at that great image through the eyes of Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 44 of Daniel 2. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, that's the millennial kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, these kingdoms that are in the image. And it, the kingdom that shall be established, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone, referring to Christ, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. These are the minerals in the image. And this is explaining what he's doing. He's going to break in pieces the iron, the brass, the silver, the clay, the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure, absolute. It's going to happen. It has to happen. You can take those two verses from the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verses 44 through 45, and you can substantiate the millennial kingdom because the Word of God is true. Whether you have two verses are 22 verses. It doesn't matter. Two verses are just as positive as 102 verses because God's Word is truth. So there has to be a time known as the Millennial Kingdom. In other words, Christ is coming back to this earth and He's going to reign for 1,000 years. He's going to reign upon the earth. Six times in six verses of Scripture, this is confirmed. If you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, beginning in verse 2, it says, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now it says a thousand years. Verse uh, 3, And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years. Twice we have the thousand years. Should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. What do you think God's trying to do? <laughs> well, he's trying to put over to us that something of a duration 
of a thousand years is going to transpire upon this earth. Notice verse 5, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Verse 6, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on the such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's uh, about five times. Notice this one, verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Six verses of Scripture, six times God talks about a thousand years. He's talking about this period of time right here, and we've uh, entitled our message the millennium, but he's talking about this time of 1,000 years when there will be health, wealth, and prosperity for everybody upon this earth, and Jesus Christ will reign on the earth from the city of Jerusalem. He's going to reign in the city of Jerusalem upon the throne of his forefather David, and that's supported by Scripture. Now, when Christ comes to the earth, there will be no more greed, suspicion. There will be no more receipts, no more cash registers, no more computers, no more jails, no more banks no more unemployment. We're going to live in a sophisticated age and Jesus Christ will be the head of all of the governments of this world at that time. Bible supports this because right now, according to the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, written by Solomon, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Everything that we do today is uh, temporary. We get a shiny new automobile and we dust it off and we get a chamois and we chamois it. We buy a special sponge and special uh, stuff that we put in the water so it won't take the wax off of the painting. And we baby that thing and we pamper it for the first two or three years. And then when it gets about 70 or 80,000 miles on it, we're ready to trade it. We don't care for it anymore. What happened? Vanity, vanity. All is vanity. Everybody wants something new. We want it bigger. We want it better. We want it faster. We live in an age of vanity. And that's all going to be done away with when Jesus Christ comes to the earth to reign for a thousand years in the city of Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that that time will be over. And I might inject this because uh, this is true. I know that some of you are not going to like what I'm going to say. There will be no more manufacturing when Jesus Christ comes to reign as king during the millennial kingdom. General Motors and Ford and uh, uh, Chrysler, American Motors, uh, all of these fine automobile companies, General Electric, all of this is going to be done away with. Because, my friends, if you analyze all of this manufacturing, it's disguised by Satan as labor-saving devices and disguised by Satan as something that will make our lifestyle much better. But you let a war come along. You remember World War Number 2? You couldn't buy a new car. Couldn't buy a washing machine. Back in Iowa, they were making machine guns at the washing machine factory. You couldn't buy new tires, gasoline. Everything was diverted to war, war. Satan is the prince of war. And he has disguised this haze of multiple manufacturing and this exorbitant lifestyle that we have He's, ex he's uh, disguised it as labor-saving devices. And he said to us, why, you need to live nice. You need to have two cars. You need to have a three-car garage. You need a washing machine. You need a dryer. You need a dishwasher uh, washing machine. You need all of this equipment. And man thinks he has to have all of that. And man just killing himself trying to get all of these things. That's the way we live. 
But when Jesus Christ comes back to the earth during the millennial kingdom, there will not be any of that. Maytag will go out of business. Whirlpool won't exist. Sears and Roebuck will close up. Why? Because everybody will go back to the style of living they had when Adam and Eve was here because man will go back to being a farmer and he'll live off of the soil. Oh, there's a lot of beautiful things in the Bible. And Jesus Christ will be sitting in a beautiful temple in the city of Jerusalem. And those of us who are born again Christians today will be reigning with Christ as ambassadors for 1,000 years. And the Bible says that the 12 apostles are going to be sitting on 12 thrones and they're going to be ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel during the millennial kingdom. All of this is in the Bible. Let me see if I can substantiate some of this so you won't think that uh, uh, something isn't right. Let's turn to the book of Habakkuk. It's an interesting little book. What does Habakkuk say? Habakkuk 2, verse 13. Notice, I shall read it for you. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire, and the people shall weary themselves for very vanity. Why, well, what we're doing is not according to the will of God. This killing ourselves and putting ourselves in mental institutions and the husband having to work a shift and the wife having to work a shift and the children are delivering the papers and, and then in the spare time they're uh, are selling uh, these different products and so forth, trying to raise money. Why? To, to get these things that Satan says we must have to have a happy home. God says you don't need all of this trash. You don't need two cars. You don't need any car. I'm going to put you back on the farm in the millennial kingdom and you'll have an ox and a cart and you'll go to market. You'll raise your food. You'll raise your clothing from the wool on the sheep, etc. and the skins on the animals. And then you'll live happy. And the king of kings will be living in Jerusalem. And the saints of God will be governing the earth at that time. The 12 apostles will be sitting on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And there will be peace and happiness and wealth and prosperity upon all of the earth at that time. And there'll be no more war. Everything's going to be serene and quiet and beautiful, and what a joy. He says in Habakkuk, notice what he says, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire and the people shall weary themselves for very vanity's sake. God doesn't want you moonlighting, working two shifts. What do you do that for? So you can pay your bills. You've got to have all of these contraptions that everybody else has and you feel like you have to stay up with the Joneses and so you buy that piece of equipment and this piece of equipment. You get another piece of equipment and you want the fourth and you say to the wife, in order to get the fourth piece of equipment, you're going to have to become a waitress in the local restaurant and so kids, uh, we're all going to have to sell herbs or uh, uh, pick up beer cans along the road or pop bottles or whatever it is. We've got to get all the money we can because we've got a life a lifestyle status that we have to maintain or we'll be laughed at in the community. That's a lot of garbage. God says, I'll put you back on the farm. He started with us on the farm. He had Adam and Eve in the garden. And they were vine dressers. And all Adam had to do was just go out in the garden, work a little bit during the day, pick off the fruit that he wanted. He didn't have all those bills coming due on the 10th. He didn't have all those plastic credit cards to bother him. No, my friends. Health, wealth, and prosperity for everyone on the earth during the millennial kingdom. Long life will be given. Absolutely. No sickness. 
Notice what it says in the book of Isaiah. It's rather interesting. In Isaiah chapter 33, verse 24, and the inhabitants shall not say, I am sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquities. Now, we have people today who preach that uh, it's not necessary that you be sick. They say God doesn't want anybody to be sick. Well, I'm sure God doesn't. But sickness is universal today. You can't stop it. If I was a divine healer, I'm not a divine healer. I believe in the divine healer, but I don't believe in divine healing. Now, if I was a divine healer, so-called, you know where I would conduct my meetings? I would go to the biggest hospital in town, and I would go up to the top floor and work my way down, and I would empty that institution within the day. I wouldn't rent to the auditorium and call the multitude in and tell them to come in their wheelchairs and in their uh, uh, beds on wheels that we're going to have a healing service at the close of the service. No, if I had divine healing power like some people are supposed to have, I would go to the hospitals one by one and I would empty every hospital in the world if I had that kind of power. I don't have that kind of power. I don't know anybody that has that kind of power. I've never seen anybody like that. I would like to meet somebody like that. But during the millennial kingdom, there will be no sickness. During this 1,000-year reign, no sickness upon the earth. Absolutely. No sickness whatsoever. Long life will be given. For instance, Adam lived 930 years over in innocency and in conscience. A man by the name of Eber lived 464 years. A fellow by the name of Sergog lived 230 years. Abraham, 175 years. Moses, 120. David tells us that 70 years is the length of our days. In Psalm 90, verse 10, he says, By reason of strength, you might reach 80 years. But then you have to lay your armor of clay down in the soil of this earth, and you die. Psalm 90, verse 10. Now, when Christ comes, the age of people will start to back up the ladder. Now, that's interesting. You see, right now, uh, we uh, here in the dispensation of grace, uh, we, well, this little drawing will help you. We start at Adam and we've gone down. Now, when Christ comes during the millennial kingdom, we'll start back up. And when a person at the end of this millennial kingdom entered the millennial kingdom, we say he was 40 years of age. When he dies at the end of the millennial kingdom, he'll be 1,040 years old because he doesn't have to die as long as he does what the king says he shall do or what he will do. Notice what it says in Isaiah uh, 65, verse 20. This is Isaiah 65, verse 20. There shall be no more than an infant of days, there shall be, during the millennial kingdom, there will not be infants, as it were, infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days, for the child shall die an hundred years old. In other words, if somebody does die during the millennial kingdom, and we'll say they uh, have sinned against God, and because they have sinned against God, then they will die then they will be as though they were an infant a hundred years old. People will speak of that individual a hundred years old as though he was a baby. Today when a child dies at two, three, four, five years of age, we say they lost their little baby or the infant died or Jesus called the baby home to heaven. But when a hundred-year-old person dies in the millennial kingdom, we would say, well, that's an old man. No, it'll be as though he was an infant because if they do what God has required of them, they can live the whole 1,000 years. So there'll be long life given in the millennial kingdom just as there is health, wealth, and prosperity for everybody that's going to live up on the earth during that time. In that day, the earth will yield her increase. 
You're wondering how if there's no manufacturing and there's no way to earn a living and Solomon calls it vanity of vanity, well, how are the people on the earth going to live during this period of time? How will they make their bread and butter, as it were? Well, they won't have any payments to start with. They won't be buying cars and refrigerators and stoves and boats and camping equipment and recreational vehicles. They won't be buying any of that. That's out. That's over with when the millennial kingdom starts. There's going to be an increase in the earth because there was put a decrease upon the earth over in the book of Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, if you'll notice what it says. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. God says, now because you have disobeyed me, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now what's this saying? This is saying that there was a curse put upon the ground for Adam and Eve. Upon the ground for Adam, and there was the curse upon childbearing for the woman. That's why the woman today has pain and labor pains when she brings a child into the world. This is to remind the woman that she transgressed the law of God. And Adam goes out to the field to labor, or the man goes out to the factory to work and he sweats, you notice how they wear the sweat bands around the forehead in the steel mills, in the automobile factories, wherever they're working? Because the sweat was a curse put upon man because he transgressed the laws of God. And God is reminding him of that. But when we come to this millennial kingdom, that is all going to be removed. There will not be any curse upon the woman in childbearing during the millennial kingdom. She'll have her, chi her child, her baby, without any pain whatsoever. And the man will produce a day's labor and earn his keep, as it were, without any sweat. Now let me turn to the Bible and pick this up. It's over in the book of Amos. The book of Amos, and we're looking at verses, uh, at least chapter 9, verse 13. Now, follow me carefully. Follow me carefully. I'm saying from the Bible that during the millennial kingdom there will not be any sweating, there will not be any labor pangs upon the woman when she brings her baby into the world. Everything is going to be beautiful. There will be health and wealth and prosperity and no war anywhere upon the earth during this 1,000-year reign. Let me read the book of Amos. Chapter 9, verse 13. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that's in the future, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine and all the hills shall melt. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. Beautiful time. The plowman is going to overtake the reaper. Now, you know what a farm is. You know what a farm is. You know what a plow is. Down in Tennessee, we put a horse in front of a plow. If it was spring plowing, we put a team of horses or a team of mules in front of a plow, and we plow up the ground. But what we were plowing was dead ground, as it were, because the crop that we had raised the year before was dead. It had been harvested. But Amos is saying when that time comes, the plowman will overtake the reaper. Here will come the plowman, and he will say to the reaper, Get out of the way. I got the plow. Come on, get that crop in. Get that thing out of the way. I've got the plow. The plowman will overtake the reaper. 
there'll be such abundance of crops. And they'll not have termites and bugs and all kinds of these things that destroy the food when you harvest it. God's going to do away with all of that. He's going to bless the earth. It's going to be a magnificent earth. Everything that your heart can possibly desire will be in abundance in the kingdom of the king in that day. Beautiful. Boy, I tell you, I'm urging people to get ready for the kingdom. Get ready to meet the king who's going to usher in the kingdom because it's going to come. I'm looking forward to living on the earth during the millennial kingdom. You know, one of my favorite foods is watermelon, and you've heard me say this a lot of times. I hope that when I reign with Christ during this thousand years, he gives me a watermelon patch on the back side of town somewhere. Boy, I'm looking forward to it. You can split the watermelon open in the evening, and you don't have to worry about the bugs eating it during the night. You can come back in the morning and start where you left off and eat all day long. Boy, I'll tell you, this kingdom that's outlined in the Word of God is something. Absolutely. And there'll be no more wild beasts. No more wild beasts. Way over in the book of Genesis, there's a scripture reference I want to share with you. It says in Genesis uh, 9, verse 2, verse, notice what it says. And God blessed Noah. This is verse 1. I want to read this to set the setting. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, this is after they came out of the ark, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and the fear of you. Now notice this. This is most important. Don't miss this. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. You notice how you're walking along a fence of a morning and the little rabbit jumps and runs? He's afraid of you. Or at night, uh, the headlights, a fox runs in front of your car. and Boy, that fox is gone and his big bushy tail goes over the fence like uh, it's terrific. All of the animals are afraid. Did you ever have a good fishing hole? I remember once I had a good f- a fishing hole back in Tennessee And I could go to that hole and just about any time catch a fish. And I remember one time I was fishing there and I could hear my heart beating. Boom, 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 boom. And some guy came up and said, what are you doing? Why, he scared all the fish away. A dumbbell, I said, what do you think I'm doing? Picking daisies? I'm fishing. Even the fish are afraid of you. Why, a good fisherman, he'll, uh, you know, he'll crouch up to the fishing pond and, and he won't let the fish and he'll crouch down and he'll get his line in there because he doesn't want the fish to see him. Fish are afraid of us. The animals are afraid of us. The birds are afraid of us. Where? Started right here in Genesis. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Notice what it says in the book of Hosea, chapter 2, verse 18. This is rather interesting. This is along the same day, same line. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. Why, during the millennial kingdom, the animals are going to have that fear taken from them. It's going to be beautiful. You can have your children out in the front yard and they can have a lion or a tiger out there, whatever they want. It's going to be a beautiful, serene situation. And the whole world is going to be transformed during this millennial kingdom. And there sits Jesus Christ in the city of Jerusalem, the apple of God's eye, upon the throne of his forefather David. And he has control of the whole universe at that time. Beautiful. And I'm going to live on the earth during the millennial kingdom. I'm going to reign with Christ. Every true believer of Jesus Christ will reign with Christ during that millennial kingdom. 
of 1,000 years. That's why we beg people to be saved. Be regenerated. Be born again. Have your sins put under the blood. Know that your sins are under the blood and that your heart has been washed clean by the sanctifying blood of none other than Jesus Christ. We're heading toward the millennial kingdom and we're closer today than Adam and Eve were ever to it. We're getting very, very, very close. Over in the book of Isaiah, I must read this for you. It's rather interesting. But in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, I'm going to read a verse. Notice what it says. This is Isaiah, chapter 11. I'm looking at verse 6. Now, this is about the animals that will be on the earth during the millennial kingdom. They will lose their fear of man. They'll lose all of their fear of man. And people won't kill animals for food in that day and age. People will live off of the soil. There's enough uh, uh, nutrients and uh, chemicals in the foods that come out of the soil, good, rich soil, to, uh, to keep your body operating as God intended it to. I'm not preaching vegetarianism. But everybody were vegetarians until Noah came out of the ark. And then God gave Noah permission to kill animals and eat the meat thereof after they, they came out of the ark. But you don't have to eat meat to have a good body. You can still get it out of the soil. And they will get it out of the soil during the millennial kingdom because the animals not, will not be slain for their food. Now here's what it says. This is Isaiah 11. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. That's the little goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. <laughs> Can't you see that? Can't you see this little boy coming up to the front porch? He's got a big lion here and a tiger here. He says, look, Mama, what I got. <laughs> Ooh, Mama has a heart attack. No. He's going to take the ferociousness in the animals away. And there'll just be peace and tranquility upon the earth. It's going to be a marvelous place. Oh, I hope you go and come with me to the millennial kingdom when the king shall reign. Notice what it says. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Now imagine a cow and a bear feeding together out of the same feed box. A great big uh, 150, 300, 400, 500 pound bear from Alaska eating with a milk cow. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the snakes. It says asp in King James, snakes, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. That's the snake. The little baby will stick his hand there where these snakes are hibernating. I remember years ago my mother was bitten by a copperhead and her arms was swollen and it became as large as an old-fashioned stovepipe. And everybody who came in said, I have heard that such and such will cure snake bites. So mother said, there you are, help yourself. And everybody was giving their remedy. They must have had 25 or 30 different remedies for snake bite. Back in Tennessee, many, many years ago, I was a little barefoot boy. Let me tell you, a snake today, the poisonous kind, don't stick your hand in there. But during the millennial kingdom, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isn't that beautiful? Am I indoctrinating you? I hope I am. Believe me, I, there's one great ambition of my life, and that's to spend a thousand years here with Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to the millennial kingdom. 
I'm looking forward to going down to Jerusalem every once in a while and see the king as he sits on his throne, none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God, sitting on the throne of his forefather David in that magnificent palace, in that temple, in the city of Jerusalem. Magnificent, absolutely. What's the reason for all of this phenomenon? There has to be a reason because if there isn't a reason, then uh, what's it all about? Notice what it says in the book of Romans, chapter 16, looking at verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Beginning over here in Genesis, Chapter 1, verse 1, we know it was a perfect earth, and then we know that Genesis 1, 2 was not a perfect earth because it was without form and void, and we know that up in heaven there was a war before Genesis 1, 1. There was a war up in heaven, and God threw Lucifer out, and Lucifer came down to this earth, and Lucifer contaminated this earth and all of the beings on this earth. And Lucifer has been turned over by God, given permission by God, to run rampant up and down this earth, bringing all of the chaos that he has wanted to to bring upon mankind, even death itself. Lucifer is the prince of death. Lucifer is the prince of this world system. He's the prince of the air. He's the prince of humanity in so much that he causes this human world to do the things that are contrary to the will of God. And the Bible says he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And God is going to put Satan, Lucifer, into the bottomless pit at the beginning of this 1,000 years. He's going to put him in the bottomless pit. Satan will be in the bottomless pit, bottomless pit. He'll be in the bottomless pit during this whole 1,000 year reign and Lucifer will have nothing to say about the way in which God's Christ manages this earth during the millennial kingdom. And that's why the Apostle Paul is saying here, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. God is going to do away with Satan. He's going to remove him. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. This is very interesting. Revelation 20, verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. What's he going to do? When Jesus Christ returns to the earth after or at the close of the 70th week of Daniel, Jesus Christ is going to come down to the earth with the saved of all nations and with the godly angels that are up in heaven, and he's going to come down to the earth, and he's going to take Satan, and he's going to turn him over to an angel, and that angel is going to put Satan in this bottomless pit for 1,000 years, the duration of the millennial kingdom. That's why you could have all of this magnificent, beautiful things going on on the earth during the 1,000 years because Satan is in jail. He's in the prison. No one to go his bail. He can't get out. God's got him locked up. And that's the reason that you can have Satan. You see why I work at my age? A number of people say to me every once in a while, you step, why don't you retire? Well, what would I retire for? What would I do if I retired? Well, you uh, go sit on the front porch of your house or get you a little cabin down by the river and fish or uh, get you a little RV and uh, maybe you can get enough money together every month to buy gasoline and just tour the country and 
kind of relax and don't work so hard. Why well, I would be wasting my time. My body would be wasting away. My mind would get fuzzy. I would sit there and dribble spittle off of the end of my chin during the day and not know whether I'd just come out of the house or was going back in or what. No, I don't want to retire. I want to work right up to the last minute telling my brothers and sisters that there's a better way, a much better way than what you're living right now. And that better way is living the way that God has. 4,000 years after Genesis 1-1, approximately after he created Adam, 4,000 years after Adam, we have Jesus coming at the first coming as a little baby. Then 2,000 years later, but 6,000 years from Adam, we have him coming at the second advent. He's going to take the church home to be with him. The church is going to be raptured, taken up in glory. Oh, I'm so excited about going in the rapture. I've wanted to go into outer space, but NASA won't take an old man like me into outer space. They're afraid that I might uh, bump off or something and have a dead body up there in that capsule with them for five or six days. But let me tell you, I'm going up without a capsule one of these days. Go up to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, going up to the judgment of my work, going up to the marriage supper. It's coming just as sure as I'm here. Then the world passes through this 70th week. Jesus comes back puts Satan in the bottomless pit, reigns upon the earth for a thousand years, and then when the thousand years are expired, he lets Satan out of the bottomless pit for a little season. If you read the latter part of the verse, chapter 20 of the book of Revelation, he lets him out for a little season, and then Satan goes up and down the earth recruiting another army to attack the city of Jerusalem like he did over here at the War of Armageddon in the 19th chapter of Revelation. In the latter part of chapter 20 of Revelation, he, he raises another army, gets this army ready to attack Jerusalem, but God sends fire and brimstone out of heaven and burns them up. They don't get to fire a single shot because God destroys them. And he takes old Satan and he throws him alive into the lake of fire where Satan is forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Oh, I tell you, it's exciting to be a Christian. It's the exciting life, absolutely. The devil has been in control of this earth long enough, I believe. Look at all the heartaches he's caused. Look at all of the tears that have been shed because of him. Look at all the little babies that have been aborted. Millions and millions and millions of them since God placed man upon the earth. Mothers that didn't want their baby or couldn't afford to have them. Our circumstances in their way of living would not permit them to come into the world. Look at all of the bankruptcies. Look at all the people who have committed suicide. Look at all of the tears, all of the heartaches, all of the trouble that's come into this world all because of Satan. God just wants to give us a little display in the millennial kingdom that it's possible to live a good, sound, pure, clean life for God. And that's why God is going to give us a display of righteousness in the millennial kingdom. I've had enough of Satan. I'm tired of him. I don't even let him come on the front porch of my house. I won't even let him ride in the back seat of my car. I don't want anything to do with him. I don't want even to go into a restaurant where he's already in there. The devil has been in control of this earth long enough. Prince of this world system, prince of death. It's Satan that takes your life when you die, not God. If God took your life, God would be a murderer. He's the prince of this air. Satan has had the earth long enough. We're going to get control of this earth. It tells us in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, looking at verse 5. Notice what it says, 5-5. Five, five. Blessed are the meek, 
that's humble. People who are interested in the things of God. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Doesn't say we're going to inherit heaven. Doesn't say that. We're going to inherit the earth. This earth belongs to us. Doesn't belong to Satan. Psalm 115, verse 16. Now, will you listen to this? The meek will inherit the earth. Psalm 115, 16. The heaven, even the heavens, that's plural. There's three heavens. First one where the clouds and the darkness are located, and then the second heaven, sun, moon, stars are in rotation. And then the third heaven where God lives. Now, keep that picture in your mind while I read this verse. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. God's given me the earth. I don't own it now. I don't own any part of it. But God has said, each step, eventually I'm going to give you a part of the earth. You're going to reign with me during the millennial kingdom. I'm going to make you an overseer of part of the earth. You said you wanted a watermelon patch. I'll give you a watermelon patch in the millennial kingdom. My friends, this millennial kingdom is just the beginning of something greater than the human mind and the human spirit has ever been able to conceive. Because after the millennial kingdom, we're going to the white throne judgment as witnesses against the ungodly, and then we're going to come back to the new earth, and we're going to reign on the new earth forever and ever and ever with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he says, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth have I given to the children of men. You see, when I give an invitation nowadays, I'm not giving an invitation to come up and join this church. Come up and go back in the back room and a deacon will come and he will have you sign a card and he'll ask you a number of questions and then a couple of Sundays later they give you the right hand of church fellowship and they say, oh, you're a member of our church. When I give an invitation, I'm giving you an invitation to come with me and live on the earth for 1,000 years during the millennial kingdom and eventually live on the new earth, the holy city of God, the new Jerusalem that John, John saw coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned to meet her husband. That's what it's all about. Getting ready to meet your husband. Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, coming in all of his stately, majestic beauty. And there is this bride of his without spot or wrinkle or any such thing presented to him. And we're going to live with Jesus on the new earth forever and ever and ever and ever. You ready? Will you come and go with me? I believe you will. Write me a letter and tell me, Mr. Step, I'm doing today, or I did today, what you told me to do. I have received Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior, and I'm on my way to the millennial kingdom, eventually to live eternally with Jesus Christ on the new 